Welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to speak about Ebenezer Scrooge, a misunderstood INTJ. The idea for this video has been banging around in my head for some time. I'm a great fan of Charles Dickens, and there are a few writers who can compare with his ability to create amazingly interesting characters with which to surround his protagonists. Often his lead characters rather run-of-the-mill, like David Copperfield, but he encounters incredibly interesting people, one after another. Oliver Twist was, unless someone attacked the memory of his mother, rather meek and unassuming, but he too encountered events and people who touch those who read Dickens' tales. But one of his protagonists that come to mind, who is not dull or unassuming, is Ebenezer Scrooge in the wonderful work A Christmas Carol. Here was a man who was well-defined from the exterior by Dickens, but I felt he missed the mark on the man's motivation. Ebenezer was described like this. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner, hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire, secret and self-contained, and solitary as an oyster. The cold within him froze his own features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. A frosty rime was on his head and on his eyebrows and his wiry chin. He carried his own low temperature always about with him. He iced his office in the dog days and didn't thaw at one degree at Christmas. External heat and cold had little influence on Scrooge. No warmth could warm, no wintry weather chill him. Could someone be thinking something like that about you? Many INTJs get this sort of reaction from others. We focus on what we are doing, not the feelings of those around us. Scrooge was almost certainly an Enneagram 5, and we fives have a passion for avarice. It is not necessarily money that we crave, but for me it is a clear demand for what I have earned and own fairly and rightly. It took me years to untangle the emotional issues of losing what I felt was owed to me by a narcissist who reneged on her vows and commitments. They were mine and they were stolen from me. Figuring out the motivation behind my pain helped me to finally toss it out for good. But Scrooge was in full-blown mercenary pursuit. His money was his money, and he wasn't going to willingly relinquish one cent of it. Dickens nailed it from the outside perfectly. We jump into the story where Scrooge had just gone through a conversation with his nephew, where the young man had used his feelings as arguments to try and convince an INTJ of the validity of his point of view. The results were, of course, predictable. Both parties were frustrated by the process, and it ended on a sour note. Already put off by this exchange, what followed was exactly how an INTJ would have reacted to what his clerk did next. This lunatic, in letting Scrooge's nephew out, had let two other people in. If you are an INTJ, you know what Scrooge would have been feeling. Idiots abound. You may work around them, or even for them, or they may work for you. Now, they are not really idiots. They may be very bright people and good people, but they make decisions based on feelings rather than facts and reason. It can lead to cross-purposes often, and I assume that every INTJ has said to himself that an idiot did something that was irritating, just like what Bob Cratchit did to Scrooge. They were portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, and now stood with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands and bowed to him. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe, said one of the gentlemen referring to his list. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Clearly here, Scrooge was probably thinking, more idiots. They don't even know who they are talking to or anything about him. Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years, Scrooge replied. He died seven years ago this very night. We have no doubt his liberality is well represented by his surviving partner, said the gentleman presenting his credentials. If Scrooge were not already upset by the encounter with his nephew, he might have laughed at such a stupid, ignorant statement. These men just barged in and started talking with no idea who they were talking to or anything about him. As Dickens pointed out at this point, it certainly was, for they had been two kindred spirits. 
At the ominous word liberality, Scrooge frowned and shook his head and handed the credentials back. He could have sarcastically cut them up at this point, but Scrooge was a civilized man of business. He let them continue. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, said the gentleman taking up a pen, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessaries. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. Now this was very true. Things were desperate for many at this time. The Little Ice Age, which ran from about 1300 to 1870, was decades from coming to an end, and crops were meager and food was scarce. Disease was common and death occurred at an early age. It was a prime motivator for Ebenezer to do his job well in order to avoid the consequences of being poor. He not only worked hard to avoid this, but he was proud of his success. The idea that he should take his hard-earned money, which he didn't even waste on non-essentials for himself, and give it to those who had done nothing in return, galled him to his very bone. Are there no prisons? asked Scrooge. Plenty of prisons, said the gentleman, laying down the pen again. And the Union workhouses, demanded Scrooge. Are they still in operation? They are, still, returned the gentleman. I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigor then, said Scrooge. Both very busy, sir. Oh, I was afraid from what you said at first that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course, said Scrooge. I'm very glad to hear it. The INTJ sarcasm finally had come out. Ever since it was first written, this has been viewed as being cold and heartless. However, INTJs are logical creatures. This was a reasoned point of view, and Scrooge was expressing what he thought was truth. To him, this view was both obvious and final, unless facts were presented to show it in error. But here the visitors failed miserably. They said to a man who never celebrated Christmas, under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body to the multitude, returned the gentleman, a few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We choose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for? The point they were making was that they wanted to make people merry on Christmas Day. That is all. It was a splurge, if you will. It would not pull the recipients out of poverty. It would just give them a party, so to speak. Immediately afterward, they would return to their dismal state. To Scrooge's way of viewing things, they were asking him to toss his money away for no good purpose. If he gave all his money to the poor, it would quickly be gone, and the end result would be that Scrooge would join them in their misery. This line of reasoning is implied by many of his comments. Nothing, Scrooge replied. You wish to remain anonymous? The feelers were just not at all getting where this INTJ was coming from. They pushed ahead as though their touchy-feely arguments were conclusive and no objection could remain after they had expressed them. This is a daily occurrence for me. People argue that such and such is a good or even necessary idea because it makes the one who is talking feel good, even though the end result will leave things as they already are or even make them worse but it will cost either your hard-earned cash or your freedom in order to accomplish this end. Scrooge had by this time run out of patience with these buffoons. I wish to be left alone, said Scrooge. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Logic had brought him to this conclusion, and nothing the others had said so far had given him any reason to change his mind. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. The first point is unclear. Perhaps it was poor health. Maybe they had living conditions that made it impossible. But the second point is probably quite true. Those places were very grim, and cheer and joy would not be found there very often, I would think. For Scrooge, he had analyzed the situation, and he knew how bad it was. This was a driving force behind his success in business. He was determined not to join the crowd of destitute people in London. So he dotted every I, and he crossed every T, and he rigidly held to the course he felt would bring him security and a solid future. Giving his money away would lead him in the opposite direction. 
If they would rather die, said Scrooge, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Besides, excuse me, I don't know that. But you might know it, observed the gentleman. It's not my business, Scrooge returned. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Seeing clearly that it would be useless to pursue their point, the gentleman withdrew. Scrooge returned to his labors with an improved opinion of himself and in a more facetious temper than was usual with him. This clearly marks out the priorities of these two types of people. Ebenezer Scrooge was about his routine and his business. Only someone who appeared to be an idiot would allow surrogate beggars into his office to tie up his time and disrupt his routine. The gentlemen viewed themselves as examples of a higher man who cared for his fellow creatures by extracting money from other, perhaps unwilling, people to help the poor have a nice Christmas. Scrooge viewed the other's opinion as being illogical and as though they might even endanger his future, which he had invested his entire adult life into creating. He felt he had made his point, and it cheered him up, having made it, even though he had no illusions that it, his logic had overcome their feelings. It had only helped to fortify his own view in his mind. Later in the story, this exchange was distorted shamefully by the ghost of Christmas present. Here, Ebenezer was referring to unknown people who were said to wish to rather die than to go to an institution for survival. He pointed out that he didn't know this assertion was even true. But if it were true, the cause of the problem would be weakened if the population were to shrink, leaving less hungry mouths to feed. The people who would be dying in this case were people who chose to do so by their own free will. When the ghost brought up these words he had said, he was referring to a specific person who had not made any such choice, and Ebenezer was showing real concern at the time and developing interest in helping the lad out. Spirit, said Scrooge, with an interest he had never before felt. Tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat, replied the ghost, in the poor chimney corner, and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, no, said Scrooge. Oh, no, kind spirit, say he will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race, returned the ghost, will find him here. What then? If he be like to die, he'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. Scrooge hung his head to hear his own words quoted by the spirit and was overcome with penitence and grief. If any man had twisted his words in this way, rather than an apparently all-powerful ghost, Ebenezer would have pointed out the absurdity of what was said. However, he had already been run through the ringer by the ghost of Christmas past, and he was not thinking clearly. If the ghost were being fair and honest, he would have seen that Scrooge had not pointed to this man or that or this child or that and said that he should die. He had specifically stated that if someone would choose to die, then it would be fine with him because it would decrease the load on an overburdened system. I think that Bob Cratchit, the clerk who was thought of as an idiot for letting in the surrogate beggars, had more insight into Ebenezer's true nature than anyone else in the book. He stood up at Christmas dinner and said, Mr. Scrooge, said Bob, I give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. Mrs. Cratchit about went into apoplexy when he said it, but in his heart he knew that even his meager wage was made secure by Scrooge's diligence to his job. He might pay a small wage, but Cratchit, if he towed the line, had tremendous job security. His family would keep a roof over their heads and food on their table, and even a small Christmas feast could be afforded. Back to the office at the start of the story. As soon as the gentleman left, kids started making a racket outside the door. So Scrooge was having trouble concentrating on his work. What INTJ doesn't know about how important your quiet space is? And some kids start singing loudly, hoping to get money as well for disrupting your work. Now what would you do? Dickens constructed the piece to imply that even the bad weather was Scrooge's fault, as he went on. Foggier yet, and colder. Piercing, searching, biting cold. If the good St. Dunstan had but nipped the evil spirit's nose with a touch of such weather as that, instead of using his familiar weapons, then indeed he would have roared to lusty purpose. The owner of one scant nose, gnawed and mumbled by the hungry cold as bones are gnawed by dogs, stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole to regale him with a Christmas carol. 
But at the first sound of, God bless you, merry gentlemen, may nothing you dismay, Scrooge seized the ruler with such energy of action that the singer fled in terror, leaving the keyhole to the fog and even more congenial frost. If you had had your quiet time interrupted unnecessarily, you might have done something similar. If he had hit the boy, it would have been different, but he just chased him away. One very cold Christmas Eve, when I was working in the training department for a company in Massachusetts, many other departments were shoving their people off early. However, when some of the trainers approached our boss about doing that, he made it clear that we were being paid until 5 o'clock and we'd be staying right up until then. I immediately thought of Ebenezer Scrooge at the time. Of course, Scrooge would not understand how any other view could be maintained. For someone who is rational and thinks that you are working to produce results, does not the following sound reasonable? You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose, said Scrooge. If quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, said Scrooge, and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound. The clerk smiled faintly. And yet, said Scrooge, you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. The clerk observed that it was only once a year. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December, said Scrooge, buttoning his great coat to the chin. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. For a man who sets his standards of work based upon actions that will affect profits, paying an employee for producing nothing was very similar to the request that the gentleman had made earlier. He was expecting to give money away for nothing. This was not at all reasonable to his way of viewing the world. However, he did allow it, even though it galled him. In the evening after work, he ate at a tavern, read the newspapers and did some paperwork, and then he headed home. Please note that to this point there is nothing that is stated or even implied that Ebenezer ever did that broke the law or even was unethical. Scrooge was a good man of business. He focused on his work seriously during working hours. He had one friend that we know of who died, Jacob Marley. The two of them set up the business together and they were of a like mind. He had no need for socializing and was quite happy with his own company. Marley was the only one who was inside his inner circle for years, and he had unfortunately died. Scrooge never stole from anyone, beat anyone up, or in any other way was shown to be evil. Aside from walking his own path, it appears that he was a good man. You could live safely next to him as a neighbor. You would not need to lock your door to keep him from stealing from you. He was a man focused and socially disconnected, but he had no malevolence towards others. He wished to leave others alone and be left alone. Live and let live, start to finish. And yet, he is condemned by the supernatural powers driving his universe in the story. His kindred spirit, literally by this time, Jacob Marley, was being tortured, apparently for eternity, by carrying around chains and heavy cash boxes as he wandered throughout the world looking at misery and unable to alleviate it. Now this is terribly absurd. Only a complete moron would set up a situation where you live your life without any directions from the super supervisors doing what you will. You could perform actions that would achieve aims and states if you were forced to, but you were not so forced. But after you die, when you can do nothing to help those you apparently were supposed to help, you must go forever in misery wishing you could help. This arrangement is insane. If the powers that existed in the story wished for misery to be alleviated, they could of course have simply alleviated it directly off their own bat. They had the power to do so, apparently. But barring that, if you're going to coerce someone in, in such a torturous manner, why not do it when it will actually do some good? Twist the arm when the arm can still perform some useful action other than wandering around helplessly whining about it. And think of the complete injustice of having Jacob Marley, whose only failing was that he died first, to be forced into eternal torment while Ebenezer Scrooge, who spent seven extra years doing the same sorts of things that Marley was being punished for, getting a pass on all that torture because he suddenly became Father Christmas after being knocked around by some ghosts. Where were Marley's ghosts? Why didn't he get a chance to dodge the bullet? Things that make you say, hmm. My wife and I have a running argument going on concerning the breakup of Ebenezer and his fiancée. She thinks it was all Scrooge's fault. I guess that is sort of a corollary that follows from the axiom that men are always wrong. Here's my take on it. Scrooge was committed to the engagement, and he was determined to see it through. 
the girl walked out on him, not the other way around. If she had stayed with him, she would have become the wife of a good and faithful man, and she would have lived well and found that an INTJ doesn't love often, but he loves deeply. But she felt his business-oriented mind was not what she wanted, and she left. The story is very brief here, and it is hard to find any details about the relationship. Clearly she was not happy, and it was just as clear that, like any good INTJ, Ebenezer was clueless about what makes a relationship run under the hood. He was obviously taken by surprise by what the girl was saying to him. He was not expecting this, and therefore was not prepared for it. I can see him thinking, what? What? I don't understand. But she was gone. He spent the rest of his life wondering what had happened. The memory was painful for him. How can you read her words and what followed and not feel pity for the poor INTJ who is doing his best in life? You may, the memory of what is past, half makes me hope you will, have pain in this. A very, very brief time, and you will dismiss the recollection of it gladly as an unprofitable dream for which it happened well that you awoke. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. She left him, and they parted. Spirit, said Scrooge, show me no more. Conduct me home. Why do you delight to torture me? As you can see, she was utterly wrong. He did feel pain, even after years had passed. So much pain, in fact, it was torture for him to think about it. Dickens spent a lot more time on describing the life that Ebenezer's former fiancé had married and happy with lots of children than he did on the time Scrooge shared with her. She obviously strongly remembered her time with Ebenezer, however, because when her husband pressed her to guess who he saw that day, she guessed it was Scrooge. The second ghost spent his time showing Ebenezer the fun that people had celebrating Christmas and how far and wide the practice was spread, from out at sea to a miner's town to the city of London. He showed Ebenezer the life that Bob Cratchit enjoyed, and Scrooge's nephew as well. As I mentioned, the second ghost twisted Ebenezer's words, and then Scrooge faced the ghost that was in the wrong holiday, because he was fitted out for Halloween. Something they don't go into much is that Scrooge got to see how the people who were on the right side of Christmas acted once he was dead. They stole his stuff and they sold it. One of his peers said he would go to the funeral, but only if someone provided free food and the ones who owed Scrooge money were glad inside that he had died because they were able to delay the payment. Tiny Tim had died through no fault of Scrooge, but somehow it feels like he was blamed for the illness that Tim was afflicted with. Finally, Scrooge was shown his own grave. Now his reaction to this is surprising to me because he knew he would die one day. We all die, and that spirit could take any one of us to our future grave, and we could look at it. It is inevitable. It might even be tomorrow. We don't like it, of course, but it's part of life, and you can be sure that an INTJ who thought things through as deeply as Ebenezer did, this couldn't have been a surprise to him. Even if he changed his ways, the grave would still be there. Anyone alive at that time would have been dead for at least a century and a half by now. Dickens wrote a fun ending to the story, where Scrooge suddenly loves Christmas and turns into a wonderful feeler who lives life like all the other so-called normal people did. In fact, he had a good laugh at Bob Cratchit's expense by pretending to be his old INTJ self for a bit and scaring the man. Who knows how far off the rails Scrooge was driven by those spirits. Did he blow his money and end up in the poorhouse? Did he continue to be a good man of business and just blow some time and money on Christmas Day? The ending makes it sound like the real Ebenezer Scrooge did die and a doppelganger took over who was an extroverted party hound. Now, I'm not trying to bash Dickens or Christmas. I happen to love both of them. Charles Dickens was an incredibly gifted writer, and I think Christmas is the best day of the year. Here's one of my favorite descriptions in this book. And now, two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the bakers they had smelt the goose and known it for their own. And basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, these young Cratchits danced about the table and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, while he, not proud although his collars nearly choked him, blew the fire, until the slow potatoes bubbling up knocked loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. I swear it feels like I really am there when I read that. But I am left to wonder about poor old Jacob Marley. While Ebenezer is having a ball and everyone is treating him like Santa Claus, his old friend is still lugging around those chains and cash boxes. I guess it's just tough luck, huh? Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please click like. 
And if you are not yet subscribed, please click that button as well. See you next time.